Today on Art Scene, we'll feature a fashion retrospective, including from 303 Magazine, a non-traditional fashion show, a look back at our very own Passion for Fashion competition, highlights from the Denver Art Museum's exhibit, Star Wars and the Power of Costume, and a current exhibit at the McNichols Building, the best of Denver Fashion Week. Hey, I'm Bobby Lefebvre and welcome to Art Scene and our Fashion Retrospective. We're here at the McNichols Building with the new exhibit, The Best of Denver Fashion Week, highlighting the 10-year history of the event. A few years ago, we highlighted a non-traditional fashion show from Denver Fashion Week and 303 Magazine. Let's take a look back. A lot of models have experience and they have talent, but they have nowhere to showcase that because of the strict industry standard. So this year, um, for the first time ever, we're hosting this non-traditional night. And um, yeah, so plus size, petite, um, tattoos, over 30, which 30 is also industry standard. Um, so we're giving everyone a chance to walk the runway for us and show us what they have. Um, I would say I probably, epitomized non-traditional model. I'm five foot two, I'm curvier, and I'm over 40, so pretty non-traditional. <laughs> And now we're going to have an opportunity where all women are wearing clothes, they're all wearing fashion. We're all here in Denver, and I think it's a wonderful thing. You know, it, it makes me happy seeing all these people, you know, different sizes, shapes, heights, ages. It's, it, it's enjoyable, you know? It's not just size zero, 5'11". this we have a plus size designer who's local her name is Anna Festa and um, she has some great collections to show us I, I definitely design around the curves I start with the body I don't start with fabric I don't start with color I don't start with shape I start with the body the female's body so I've got lots of sneaky tricks of how I'm always trying to make a woman two inches taller and two inches narrower. I'm constantly trying to make people look slimmer and you know enhance their curves. I've been working on my brand for, the brand's only been about four or five years, but this year's our turning point. It's everyone, there's a plus size revolution out there and we are leading the charge. Like to make a woman feel beautiful in what she's wearing and feel confident and be able to walk out of her home with her head held high, that's all you can expect from a designer and that is fantastic if any designer can do that for a woman. Now, since that unique event, all of the designers from Denver Fashion Week now use at least one non-traditional model in every one of their shows. And here at the Best of Denver Fashion Week exhibit, you can see great photographs and fashions all from local designers. 
We've even hosted our own fashion competition with students from Colorado Institute of Art, Passion for Fashion. If you could describe your design style in one word, what would that word be? Classic. Christian Dior is the pure elegance that he brought back to the women's shape, bringing back the fullness of the dresses, with Charles Frederick Worth being the first father of couture, kind of want to follow in his footsteps and just bring back those couture techniques that have been lost for so many years. to describe your design style in just one word, what would that word be? Glamorous. Now, I understand that you are a fan of hand-stitched, beaded, and embroidered work. What is it about that process or that style that uh, really, really excites you? There's more craft into it. It makes it more high quality. You know, there's more heart that goes into it. If you could describe your design style in one word, what would that one word be? Uh, Post-apocalyptic evening wear. I uh, always do issues that are within the world. Uh, I feel like fashion is a great media to uh, discuss these issues. Uh, so within my collections, I always have some type of issues. Uh, right now I'm showing Depths of No Return, which is about uh, talking about if the world had no water left on it. So the uh, looks are uh, living in that kind of environment.
Margaret Sanzo was part of New York's Fashion Week for 2017. She's not part of this competition because she's already graduated, but we just had to meet her and show you some of her unique designs. I started sewing when I was five. My mother taught me and uh, on a little hand crank sewing machine. And uh, I remember growing up, my mother had boxes of old sheer curtains and I would wrap them around my body and sort of make my own gowns that way. So I think I had that in my blood even as young as five years old. This is Karen. Karen is wearing a garment called Blue Heron, which was a wading bird that lives in the Chesapeake Bay. It's a poly blend and ostrich feathers. This is Carly. She's wearing manta ray. Manta ray is seen in Chesapeake Bay in the summer, and it's also made of poly blend with chiffon. Lisa is wearing Chessy. Chessy is a legendary sea monster seen around Chesapeake Bay. It includes a poly blend, chiffon, and feather boa. Stephanie is wearing York. The York River is in the surrounding area. This is made of crepe back satin with chiffon shoulder drape. I think because of our location, I think in the next five to 10 years, I think Denver is going to be a huge, huge fashion scene. I really see it coming. The winner of our fashion competition was Eddie Rickey. More of our fashion retrospective after the break. Including from Denver Art Museum, Star Wars and the Power of Costume. received a private tour from Denver Art Museum as they hosted Star Wars and the Power of Costume. Talk to us a little bit about how Star Wars and the Power of Costume came to be. Well, it's an exhibition that was originally put together by the Smithsonian Institution for Traveling Exhibition Services and they partnered with the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art and realizing that they had never had a traveling exhibition on the Star Wars costumes. So they put together 60 costumes and this wonderful exhibition to travel all over the country. And of course, the Denver Art Museum was excited to bring it to Denver, yeah. but as the Denver Art Museum, we always have to make it our own, and so we added a bunch of stuff, and I'm excited to show you. Very, very cool. I'm excited to see it. Yeah. Um, so what are we standing in front of? What is this here? This is the very first storyboard for the opening frame of the original Star Wars. So this is about 1975, the first vision for that opening crawl. Sure. And you can see how it's a little bit different uh, than what it ends up being, but still a vast sea of stars and the, you can see the movement, so the intention was there. The creativity always starts with an idea on paper. Sure, sure. And that's what this is. Very cool. Can you show us around? Let's do it. Awesome. Let's go. So I wanted to show you, Bobby, these um, costumes that we're starting with. Obi-Wan Kenobi from the original Star Wars movie 1977, kind uh -huh. of ragged, and then Queen Amidala from the prequels and that's played by Natalie Portman. And sure. this dress is really interesting because 
Um, you can see those orbs on the bottom. Yeah. They're lanterns, so that when she kind of was presiding over her, sure, <laughs> you sure. know, her kingdom, those would light up. But wow. they had to figure out a way to make that work um, in a costume. So she had a little, almost a car battery in between her legs to make them light up. Wow. Uh, so Natalie Portman had to deal with uh, kind of a lot with this costume. A lot going on there. Yeah. <laughs> And now we're looking at, this isn't like, these aren't prototypes, these appear in the movies. These are the real costumes that we saw in the movies. Yeah, every costume you see here is a real one worn by the real actors, wow. Alec Guinness and Natalie Portman in this case. Yeah. We'll see a lot of drawings that are original from the concept artists, so everything you see is right from the horse's mouth, wow, I guess. Wow, very, very cool. This is awesome. Here's something that's been beloved, especially in um, the recent couple of weeks, is this um, sure. Princess Leia's costume, mm -hmm. uh, her kind of iconic white dress. And this is really cool because it's an original drawing of that costume, concept art for that costume. It's kind of plain, but just lovely. And we just loved the, the simpleness of it sure, and sure. Um, how iconic yeah, her costume absolutely. is. So what has the energy been around you know, this particular you know, costume or anything with Princess Leia, given yeah. the, the news that we've received recently. Yeah, people have really strong memories and associations and, you know, feelings toward um, Carrie Fisher. Sure. And of course, toward the character, Princess Leia, because she was kind of this, such a strong hero. Mm -hmm. So we set up a table where people could write memories and, um, you know, notes to Carrie oh, Fisher wow. in her memory. Some of the responses we've gotten are just lovely and really impactful. Sure, sure. It's really cool that you can do that. You guys have been able to make this sort of interactive for folks, too to yeah. have a little bit of pop culture therapy through this this difficult process. It's really true. It's uh, it's nice to kind of have a piece of her, <laughs> you know, sure, in, in a sure. way here. This is really, really cool. Yeah. But she is one of the more plain and simple uh -huh. costumes um, in terms of royalty, which is the section we just entered. Yeah. You'll see as we go through, really, really outdid themselves in the prequels with the royalty. The yeah. queens are really extravagant costumes that are inspired by different cultures, amazing fabrics and luscious materials that we hope that people can get really close to. We put them in cases yeah. so that people really could get right up to them Absolutely. without danger of, um, you know. I mean, look at how intricate these costumes yeah. are. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's so much detail here between the, the beadwork and, and the embroidery, it's just, it's quite amazing, really. It is amazing. And what's even more amazing almost is that some of these costumes are only on screen for a few seconds. So you may not really, you don't get that sense of how detailed and intricate. Sure. I mean, these are like haute couture, handmade, yeah. hand embroidered, everything. It so. says a lot about the production and the production value Definitely. and the artistry that, you know, uh, George Lucas felt was important to make these films. Absolutely. That's it awesome. Does. The folks at the Lucas Museum were kind enough to kind of go to their warehouse, which we didn't visit as part of our research, but they did, and they had a great time finding things that, you know, they, they didn't even necessarily know they had. Sure. Um, like some of the um, pieces of fabric we have over here that you can get up close to and see really how the embroidery is made and how they layered the fabric and what inspired it. So cool. I like this setup here where you have there's a drawing of a costume that sits directly on the opposite end of that. So tell me about this drawing and, and this costume. Yeah, we wanted to show, again, kind of that creative process, how something goes from paper mm -hmm. to actual material. Right. Um, and in this case, it's a really fun story. The artist, Ian McKegg, was, um, was here, and he was you know, walking around telling us stories, and one was that this drawing, he wasn't terribly happy with it, so he actually kind of crumpled it up and threw it to the side. Um, and then George Lucas was coming in for their weekly meeting, and he saw that some of the artists had more, the other artists had more drawings than he did, so mm -hmm. he took that one and kind of smoothed it out and traced the crumples with, um, with ink so that they actually became this lace that featured prominently in the dress wow. and it was an accident and really? George Lucas loved the lace that he had created. That's so. crazy. So these are the little things that like like you said even the biggest fan would have no idea that that is the way that this you know particular costume came to be. Yeah. And I think it says a lot about the artistic process as well. You know sometimes artists you know we're we're interesting folks sometimes we don't like something we don't yeah. necessarily know how it's going to resonate with someone else. So to have these backstories of how these things were created and how a mistake or, or maybe even doubt 
created, you know, this, this costume that George Lucas was like, no, no, this is awesome. We're going to do it this way. Totally. Really, really cool inside information. Yeah, I think it's really fun, too. Yeah. And, and it just shows you that, like, nobody's perfect. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And you, you said, you know, the, the way that the lace and the crumbling, you know, created this costume. And if we come over here to actually see it, you can totally imagine a piece of paper crumbled up, you know, and then somebody tracing the outline of a crumbled up paper and, and creating this really, really pretty black lace thing. Yeah, it's awesome. and all that lace was hand woven. Took a month or so to hand weave all that wow. lace in the front. So something that, yeah, started out as a crumple um, ended up being a really time consuming and beautiful process. Yeah. So, I mean, think about that. Do you happen to know, like, I, I'm sure it varied, but like, how much time did they spend constructing each one of these costumes? Yeah. Months and months. I mean, there, there was a workshop of, um, I've heard anywhere between 60 and 100 um, craftspeople, uh, wow. you know, specialists in embroidery and pleating and, um, you know, lace making and weaving, all working together yeah. um, for months um, on these costumes, That's especially quite, the queens. Quite amazing. Yeah. Here we are at one of the favorites, one of the most iconic costumes in the whole exhibition. Yeah. A lot of people's, you know, favorites. Lots of memories of different sorts associated with this Princess Leia costume. Yeah. <laughs> um, when she was, she wore this bikini, but Jabba the Hutt made her wear it as a slave. In, and she flipped that around and used it to kill him. Kill him. Yeah. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So she used the chain to actually choke him. So mm -hmm. it's kind of turns out to be an empowering thing after all. So sure. really fun um, to have this in the exhibition. So this is the costume shop. So okay. this is after we saw all those drawings, this is where the drawings go to actually be made into three dimensions. Okay. So this is a really cool space where a lot of this stuff has never been seen before. So the folks at Lucas Museum found um, the silk screen for us and some patterns and bolts of fabric and other really cool stuff that you wow. guys should take a look at. Um, but what I really wanted to share was this costume. Sure. This is a peacock and brown gown worn by Padme Amidala mm -hmm. in episode three and it's just intricate and just beautiful and gorgeous and the reason it's called peacock and brown is because with the light the fabric shifts from this peacock teal to brown you can see that yeah, yeah. but in the end you might not recognize it because it was cut from the film the scene in which she wears this was cut from the film really so it's so really all this work was done <laughs> right this beautiful thing was made <laughs> yeah. and they didn't put it in the movie yeah I guess the, the wow. scene didn't quite work so sure. it was gone but I'm really excited that we got to share it with this exhibition because really in the costume shop it makes a perfect case study for yeah. kind of the preparation of a costume and all the work that can go into it Absolutely. and it might not even end up on screen so this is the Galactic Senate okay. from the prequels. And it was another way for the costume team to really kind of get creative because they had to make different costumes that reflected the different senators' planets, sure. home planets. So they really got diverse and creative with these, with those costumes in the Senate. Yeah. And this is Padme's journey. So this is all focused on um, Padme Amidala, who's played by Natalie Portman. Uh -huh. Um, and this is the dress that George Lucas designed or helped design. Okay. He really wanted to have a hand in designing this dress for a very special, important moment in the story mm -hmm. where Anakin and Padme fall in love. Yeah. Um, and so, yes, who would not fall in love with her wearing this dress? It's gorgeous. I mean, the, look at those feathers. Yeah. It's really, really pretty. It's really cool. And they also use like vintage pieces, to, like this whole thing on her front is made of vintage jet beads. So oh, wow. they really took you know, pains to find the right material. Yeah, they paid attention and they made it They made it special. Yeah, they did. That's great. And it, it worked, they fell in love, and the rest is history. It's it, yeah. <laughs> and there's things like this, with this robe right here, mm -hmm. is hand smocked, so that's like kind of an embroidery um, sewing technique. Okay. Hand smocked ro velvet robe, gorgeous, on screen for like, you know, five seconds. And the woman who made this dress, um, did it for eight months, no, nothing else. For eight months, she hand smocked this, and then after it was done, she stopped making costumes wow. <laughs> for films. So that was that. She needed a break after that. Yeah, yeah. But I would assume seconds. You said this was on screen for seconds. I think so. I haven't wow. timed it, but sure. it was not a very long. Not very scene. long. But gorgeous, gorgeous dresses here to kind of show all the phases of Padme Amidala's sure. life and identity.
You can see the best of Denver Fashion Week through April 7th. And the event ends in a marketplace where you can purchase fashions that appeared on this year's runway, all to support local designers. Hey, thank you for joining us for our fashion retrospective. We'll see you next time as we discover more of Denver's art scene.